Good. Um, right. My name is Per Engsel, still. Um, <laughs> uh, today I'm presenting joint work um, with uh, Karina Mood um, at Stockholm University and Jan Jonsson at uh, University of Oxford and Stockholm University. Um, if you look at the title here and uh, compare it to the title on the program, um, you notice that I've lost words at the end. Um, it's a multimodal uh, investigation, not a multimodal investigation, and an open data set. Um, we plan on making the data available, but uh, we couldn't make any time, so we're not quite there. So, so what I'm showing you is working progress, and um, every any kind of input is very appreciated. Uh, but we do have some results. Um, so, uh, yeah, so um, my field of research um, is intergenerational mobility research. And uh, the question that we try to answer in this field is how strongly is um, economic status or socioeconomic status transmitted um, from parents to their children? Um, and this is generally held to be an important political uh, question. Uh, because it sort of indi indicates uh, the, the degree of, of openness um, in a society in line with the sort of liberal ideal of um, equality of opportunity. So if there is uh, more uh, mobility throughout the distribution, it, it indicates that the sort of opportunity to um, uh, rise through the ranks is, 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 is greater and um, accidents of, of birth have a lesser role. Um, there's a long tradition uh, in this field uh, of research in sociology studying um, the inheritance of, of education or social class. Uh, more recent work has turned to study income correlations, uh, which is what we do here. Um, income, this, this, these <coughs> concepts differ somewhat. Uh, we think of income as a relatively sort of final indicator of, of, of economic success that subsumes um, uh, much of this sort of in impact of educational and occupational uh, inheritance in, in, in one measure. Uh, but income is also more uh, difficult to measure and, and more open for, for different uh, operational organizations and, and uh, more sensitive to measurement error and so on. Um, uh, even if uh, you've never uh, really come across this uh, research, you might, may have seen this graph, um, which is popularly known as the Great Gatsby Curve. Um, so it shows on the x-axis uh, the degree of income inequality in the cross-section uh, measured by the Gini uh, coefficient. Um, and uh, on the y-axis, uh, you have the intergenerational earnings elasticity, so the regression coefficient of uh, log child earnings on log um, parent earnings or, 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 or son earnings on father earnings in this uh, case. So uh, what this graph shows you is that there tends to uh, be a correlation such that the higher degree of uh, inequality, the less mobility from one generation to the next, which sort of suggests that uh, inequality may be detrimental to uh, equality of opportunity. Now, this is only a scatter plot, right? Um, uh, so it's very hard to say you know, whether one is causing the other uh, what is going on. Uh, and that makes it important to study trends um, over time in a given country as sort of one step uh, closer to, to addressing uh, this issue of, of mechanisms uh, or causality. Um, the case we're studying here is Sweden, which is notable uh, in that it's uh, one of the countries where, um, or the countries among uh, sort of rich um, Western industrialist countries where income inequality has increased the most. Um, so so if, if there is uh, some sort of causal link um, between these two variables, we would expect um, uh, transmission to get stronger over time in Sweden. Um, uh, so, 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 so stronger transmission, uh, less mobility, less um, equality opportunity. Uh, you may say. Um, so we're studying cohorts born, uh, 15 cohorts born uh, uh, from 1958 to 1972. Um, we have uh, population register data, administrative data covering the whole population. Um, so each, each of these uh, birth cohorts um, is about uh, 80,000 in, uh, individuals. Um, we have annual income data throughout people's lives. Uh, based on tax records, and we also have uh, data to, 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 to link, identify pairs of parents and children in, in uh, this. Um, now, 
in, 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 in looking at the income, there is a large number of uh, choices of definition and coding that you can make. So uh, do we talk about income or earnings, um, uh, with or without benefits, pre or post tax and transfer? Uh, do we study the individual household as unit? Um, uh, you know, if, if the latter, do we equivalize uh, by household size or not? Um, and um, uh, there are also different uh, parameters of association, uh, regression coefficients, uh, correlations, rank order correlations. Um, there are uh, uh, decisions such as whether uh, we should log income or not, how should we handle extreme values, zero or negative incomes, and so on. Um, uh, issues of um, subpopulation, which I'm not going to talk about here. Um, and also, um, wh at what age do we measure income, how many years do we average over, and so on. Um, some of these choices seem more or less arbitrary. Um, others sort of imply uh, different theories. So if we think that um, it's actually the case that sort of inequality increases, it makes uh, poor parents less equipped to invest economically in their children, and their children then go on to earn less on average. Um, uh, then, so, so, so there is a sort of causal kind of investment mechanism. Then uh, it would be theoretically appropriate to look at uh, disposable um, household income during formative childhood years. Um, if we would rather see income as a, as a sort of proxy um, for parents' human capital or, or skills that are sort of transmitted non-economically to, to children, um, uh, then uh, uh, individual earnings uh, would seem more appropriate. So, so depending on what we find for these different definitions, we, we may also sort of choose to um, so different theories of what's going on is more or less possible. Um, so this is the result of a um, survey that uh, my co-author Karina Mood did um, of existing studies in this field. Um, so these are all studies, um, and I know you cannot uh, read um, the cells of this table in the back or even in front. Uh, but each 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 row is a study. Each column um, is. Uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a operational choice, um, if you will, and um, the point here um, being that all these studies basically uh, use the same data. Um, they make different choices about how to define uh, and, and code things, and they up, end up with uh, correlations that vary quite widely um, in size. Um, so um, just looking at you know, the subset of estimates for uh, sons um, income, the correlations here range from 0.11 to 0.32. Um, and it's, uh, the, there are so many differences in these studies uh, that it's hard to judge uh, what is actually driving this difference. Um, so the fact that there are so many research degrees of freedom here is that we, we would sort of implement this in kind of a, a with, with an open science um, uh, approach um, and you know share all our data, all our code. If we could do that, that would be great. Uh, the hurdle, however, of course, is that this data are highly confidential. Uh, access is restricted to um, you know, a selected group of researchers, so uh, we, we cannot really do that. So um, the question is, what do we do instead to be as open uh, and transparent as possible? And uh, what we chose to do um, was to implement a uh, multimodal analysis. Um, so this is an approach that has been uh, around uh, for, for, for a few years, uh, or well, a decade actually. Um, uh, but uh, I, uh, recently it sort of um, gained renewed popularity and it's reappeared um, under various names. Uh, so you may have heard uh, terms like multimodal estimation, computational robustness analysis, multiverse analysis, p-curve, etc. Uh, we saw some examples of some of these approaches yesterday. Um, but the basic um, approach is the same um, regardless of the name. Uh, we, we make a more or less exhaustive list of reasonable analytical choices. Uh, we then define a model space uh, based on possible combinations thereof. Um, and uh, in the last step, we sort of examine how the parameter of interest varies across this space. 
Um, and these are the analytical distinctions that we looked at. Um, we looked at three different measures of association, uh, regression coefficient, correla uh, correlation, rank correlation. Uh, we uh, try to uh, take logs of income or not. Um, we look at different units, uh, individual, household, uh, different income types. Um, we exclude or include uh, zeros. Um, uh, and we uh, try to cap um, very high values at four standard deviations, um, or not. Um, and uh, then finally, we look at uh, different ages and different um, windows of observation. And there is a large literature out there that has looked at uh, these last two aspects. Uh, so we think it's interesting here to uh, compare uh, variation in this dimension with, 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 with some of these other um, dimensions dimensions of potential variation that have been less uh, studied in the previous literature. Um, so once we take all the possible combinations of these, we, we end up with a very large number of specification, uh, 500,000 uh, of them. Um, and um, this uh, quickly becomes very hard to uh, grasp. So, so the question is, uh, okay, great, you know, we, we, we wrote the loops, we did all the analysis, now, now what do we do? Um, so uh, first, I want to give you a flavor of some of the existing approaches. Um, so this is uh, from a recent paper by Young and Holstein in Sociological Methods and Research. Um, uh, it's essentially uh, the same type of figure that we saw in Augsburg and Bödel's um, um, uh, presentation yesterday. Um, so what Young and Holstein did, they wrote a fantastic uh, state uh, ado file to automate this type of analysis. But um, in terms of visualization, um, it, it, it doesn't give you much more than um, you know, this fairly basic sort of distribution of, of estimates. And it's hard to judge, you know, what, 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 what is driving the variation here? Are some of these um, specifications more or less reasonable? So on. Um, another approach then, uh, uh, this is from a paper uh, in Perspectives in Psychological Science by Zara Stegen and uh, co-authors. Um, and this is actually reanalyzing the data that uh, Jeremy Fries was talking about yesterday about ovulation and political preferences. Um, so they uh, uh, reanalyzed this data and looked at the interaction. And what you see here uh, on the right hand side is uh, for the two variables that they interacted, they chose um, different um, specification or different codings, different definitions. Um, and uh, the color shows you whether uh, the p-value is um, uh, below the alpha threshold or not. This is the distribution of p-values. Um, finally, um, what we feel is perhaps the most promising approach uh, is uh, what's uh, being called the, uh, the specification curve. Uh, this is from a paper by, or was proposed by uh, Simonson et al. in a paper that I think is still um, unpublished for, from 2015. Um, someone should correct me if I'm wrong. The figure is actually um, uh, from uh, an, a very nice paper by Julia Rohr, who is probably live tweeting me as I speak. Um, so we think all, all these approaches are um, uh, useful um, and they serve their purpose, but in our case, uh, we found them to be a bit limited. Um, so uh, first of all, if you look at um, the x-axis here, so I should say that the upper panel here shows you a distribution of estimates. Um, the color coding uh, is for significance versus non-significance, and each of these rows in the bottom panel, uh, again, sort of codifies uh, different types of analytical distinctions. Um, and, and this is fine if you have um, a couple of hundred specifications, but it rapidly becomes difficult when, when, when you have uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of them. You can draw a subsample, of course, but um, uh, if that subsample is like 1% of all the possible models, it sort of stops being very informative. Um, so what we decided to do uh, was to uh, program a shiny interface, um, similarly uh, to uh, what we saw in another presentation yesterday. Um, 
So this is unfortunately um, still in progress. Um, so I'm not going to show you um, that now. Um, but, but this is what we hope to arrive at. Uh, and uh, you can also see in the background here my uh, terrible, atrocious code and all the error messages I'm getting. So truly an open kitchen here. Um, so uh, instead of this, uh, I'm going to show you uh, some uh, selected results, um, unfortunately, with no, with no uh, pointing and clicking. Um, this uh, first then is the distribution of estimates that we get looking at the rank correlation uh, for men versus women. You can see these two big humps. Um, uh, that's um, depending on which parent uh, you look at then. So uh, mother's earnings uh, are less predictive of uh, child income for both men and women. Um, and uh, you also see that women are sort of uh, so daughters uh, are more concentrated um, uh, uh, towards the middle uh, of, of, of the distribution here. Um, whereas for men, you see sort of stronger uh, polarization where uh, father to son income is quite strongly transmitted, um, whereas the uh, transmission from mother to son is the weakest. Uh, this is the same thing, just looking at the, um, the, 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 cor the linear cor correlation, so the, the, the Pearson correlation, instead of the rank correlation. Uh, you can see a bit more going on here. There are you know, more outliers, so this is obviously more sensitive measures, me measure. Um, uh, you also see that there are several humps here, um, where as in the previous graph we only had two. So the, the, Additional humps here are uh, attributable to, to whether you log income or not. It doesn't matter in the rank um, specification, but it does um, for, for a linear correlation because it um, puts different weight at different uh, parts of the distribution. Um, this is then uh, separating uh, family income uh, from uh, the individual income of parents. Uh, and we see actually, uh, and this is only for sons now, uh, so we see actually that father's individual income uh, is actually slightly more uh, predictive uh, of uh, son's income than um, family income, which, which sort of speaks against this uh, idea of, of uh, parent investment. Um, if it was the actual amount of uh, money that the household uh, commanded over that mattered, we should expect a disposable family income to, to have a strong correlation. Um, but the question I want to get to now is um, the trend. Um, so this is just one uh, selected graph plotting all the correlations uh, for uh, sons, split up by cohort. Um, and you can see that the, the, uh, regardless of uh, which parent you look at, whether you look at family or, or individual income, um, the trend here is remarkably flat. Uh, but there is also um, you know, a fair degree of variation. So this suggests that um, if we look hard in these patterns, we, we, can, we can find quite drastically uh, different trends. Um, and this is just as an, as an example to, to, to show you that I, I've pulled out sort of two extremes of the distribution of trends here. Um, and uh, just you know, to make the point that um, if you were only looking at one of these um, estimates, you might arrive at quite uh, different conclusions uh, about whether uh, income transmission is increasing or decreasing. Now, not all these specifications are equally plausible, so uh, uh, it, it, it's not um, that you know a, a careful. A uh, judicious researcher would be equally likely to end, uh, arrive at any one of them, uh, but still, there, there is a fair degree of, of variation. Um, to look at the full um, range of variation in the trend, um, we, we uh, plot the trend um, by uh, different definitions um, of um, uh, income. Um, and uh, this is uh, looking. Let's see. Uh, this is looking at sons and fathers, um, and you can see that um, the, the the sort of uh, 
mass here is kind of concentrated uh, around either no trend or actually a decrease in the correlation. Um, looking at the same for fathers and daughters, um, there is, on the other hand, uh, quite marked increase in many of these uh, specifications, and uh, decrease is uh, more hard to find. So to wrap up, um, the contribution we make here methodologically is that uh, we, 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 we think we show that it's possible to sort of conduct uh, transparent and, and robust inference um, uh, with this kind of um, administrative data. Um, and uh, we, we think that this has potentially wide uh, implication. Um, administrative data is becoming an increasingly important source for social research. It has been for a long time in the Nordic countries, but it's becoming uh, increasingly important in, in other countries as well. Um, what do we find then? Uh, These different operational choices make a large difference um, for, for the size of the correlations. Uh, so with equally reasonable choices, um, looking just at men, uh, this um, Correlations do vary between 0.15 and 0.30. Um, they're lower for women. Um, the trend is flat for men. Um, there's been a slight increase for, for women with you know, increased labor, female labor force participation. Um, correlation is weaker for disposable than labor income, which kind of speaks against the idea of, of um, economic investments as driving um, um, these correlations. Um, we also find that um, depending on which part of the distribution you put weight on, you find slightly different results. So uh, linear correlations are higher than logged uh, correlations, which put a higher weight in the bottom of the distribution. Um, the correlation is also stronger when we exclude uh, extreme values, either high incomes or uh, zero incomes. Uh, and the plan now going forward, uh, we want to uh, do more work to make sense of um, some of these differences, but uh, in due time, we also plan to make this data available um, to anyone so that researchers who don't uh, have access to the primary data can, can use um, these estimates to sort of both assess the robustness of various claims that are made uh, in this literature, but also test um, some uh, of these sort of substantive theories of, of mechanisms uh, that are uh, driving the transmission of, of income from parent to child. And that was my final slide, so thank you. Um, yes, I actually have uh, three questions and or comments uh, because I find this really uh, fascinating. So the, the first, like the, the general um, re new popularity for new m methods to show model sensitivity is very exciting, I think. Um, and uh, you mentioned um, that with the uh, specification curve analysis, you, you didn't know how to deal with the many, many cases yet, mm -hmm. but probably you're aware of this new paper by M Amy Orban, uh, which came out a few weeks ago and uh, had a splash on Twitter, where they also have like 600,000 specifications or something. Oh, okay, yeah. And so they kind of adapted her graph, I think, but you might have mm -hmm, a look at that. Mm -hmm. It was published in Nature right, Human yeah. Behavior. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm aware of the paper. I will have to have a look at that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that was the first comment. Um, and then the second thing, I not only to make the model sensitivity transparent is interesting, but also to give the readers or reviewers a chance to interactively engage with the data, which is like a second feature is really Absolutely. interesting. Yeah. And I know we also thought about how to do this in our research and like our choice was to do it with Code Ocean because in Code Ocean you also have the chance to create an um, graphical user, user interface, but okay. it's actually not entirely convincing. So my question would be, are you planning to make like your Shiny app itself mm -hmm. available for other researchers who uh, want to, because I would be interested in, yeah. in applying this uh, from, from my research. And um, so this was the second point. And third point is actually a question now. Um, 
which is you mentioned that not all, not all specifications are equally plausible and I was always wondering like how, how do we deal with this for example in the specification curve like all specifications are que uh, treated e equally and yeah yeah uh, okay I think those are great uh, question uh, yeah the, the the first point um, I responded I yeah I, I've seen the paper I don't know exactly what they did I mean the graph in the paper I think is very similar to what I, I showed from the raw at all paper so I don't know if they just draw a subset of specifications um, but I, I, I have to look into that um, Code Ocean, yeah, um, I wasn't aware of that. Um, yes, yeah, so I was showing I am in the progress of, 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 of uh, making a shiny interface for this. Um, I'm not really a programmer, so I don't trust my code to be all that efficient or useful, but I'm, of course, very happy to share it with anyone. Um, but I think a lot of these things are fairly sort of generic. Um, if, if you're, you know, if you're into R programming, um, you, you, you can, um, uh, you, you can put it together fa fairly easily. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think, um, I, I think this is something that should definitely be wider applied, but I, as, as such, um, I don't think this is perhaps a massive uh, innovation. Um, and um, the last point was about, yeah, how do we do, deal with specifications that are uh, differentially, uh, di dif well, differently possible? Um, yeah, so, so that's uh, a great question. Um, so I've been think we've been thinking about this a little bit. So even sort of putting the data in the Shiny app, um, I, I quickly realized that um, it's, it's, impo it's almost impossible to vary like all of these parameters at once, right? Um, so, um, and, and that was actually the hurdle uh, uh, that for me that I'm trying to, to overcome, uh, but it's connected to the question of like how do we select, because then if you want the user to vary one parameter, um, then you, you have to choose like how do you treat the, the sort of options that are hidden. So one option would be to take just the average across all specifications, but this is I think not the best approach because um, some of them will be uh, better than others. So for example, when it comes to um, ages and uh, windows of observation, we know that sort of measuring uh, earnings uh, or income at the height of the career and for more years rather than fewer is better. Um, it gives you a more reliable measure. Um, so there we would sort of like, if the user doesn't select anything, we would like to be the best, you know, the best, um, uh, uh, the best option uh, we would like to be selected as a default. Um, so this, I think, is something that you can do uh, by, by sort of having a default in, in each of these dimensions where it makes sense. Um, and, you know, as long as the user doesn't manipulate that, um, you, 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 you can give them a default um, that, that we think is most appropriate, but then you can always give them the choice of sort of varying any given dimension. I think that is probably a promising way to go. So. I only have to implement it in my R code. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, I want to follow up on the last point um, that was made before. So um, I think com from a computational point of view, of course, it's possible now to do this. And Munoz Young say, so with computer power, now you should do this. Mm. Right? It's not justified to only show five robustness tests. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it would have to be a little bit more. Um, elaborated or complicated so I mean, from a textbook point of view you should start with theory right so you would mm. think about the causal map a DAC maybe so this might help you to sort out some models that you mm. don't have to run because they don't make sense theoretically mm. or there might be a collider in the model and mm. then um, from a computational point of view I think it would be possible to include then certain specification tests like a normal distribution, multicollinearity tests, and so on into this. And then you could also, I mean, then you would have to check for all these models how they perform uh, for the specification tests. And then you would see, for example, that some have no multicollinearity, others might have higher multicollinearity. And mm. then I don't know what to make out of it, but at least you would see uh, some models are better specified and they should be weighted more yeah. than other models. Uh, yeah, no, I think these are incredibly um, useful suggestions here. What I'm showing, uh, n none of these estimates really involve more than 
few variables. Uh, so it's like a purely bivariate correlation. Um, and what we're varying um, is instead the definition of what we have on the on the uh, x and, and y hand side. So uh, in that case, I think you know specification tests would be less you know useful in guiding us because they wouldn't differentiate be between any of these models actually. Um, but what we can do, of course, is um, yeah. I mean, one one thing uh, would be to um, draw. Uh, a subset, a subsample, and say like, are some of these definitions more variable? Um, um, you know that 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 would uh, lead you to think that they are less re reliable and, and could be discarded on that basis. Um, as to uh, and this is a general point, right? So what I, the variation I showed you here, uh, it, it there are many sources of variation that we don't take into account. Uh, we don't take into account sampling variability because we are looking at the whole population. Uh, we don't really take into account measurement error uh, because we are able to observe the truth more or less. Um, and then there was a point about causal models. I think this is an excellent point, and this is very, very relevant in our case. Um, so one reason um, why we end up with such a large number of specification is that we correlate like, each um, uh, definition of parent income uh, with uh, each uh, definition of child income. And you might think it's more appropriate to have the same thing um, on uh, your uh, uh, right and left hand side of the equation. Um, so, so I think, and that's like one uh, way to reduce the complexity here. Um, but it's not necessarily what you uh, want always. I think there are some. If you look, if you're looking to have different things on your, uh, you know, x and y axis. Um, there are some combinations that are uh, more or less plausible. So, so I, I would say a lot of papers in the literature estimate something like, you know, they're looking at individual earnings of the child as a measure of sort of um, human capital uh, or earnings power. But then uh, when it comes to parent income, they are looking at uh, family disposable income as uh, sort of guided by this notion that it's really the, mo the money that parents are able to uh, invest that then matters for uh, their children's educational attainment and earnings later on and so on. So, uh, so yeah, you might uh, want to allow some asymmetry there, but uh, you know, putting it the other way around, uh, using parent earnings to predict um, child uh, disposable income or household income, something like this, might not make a lot of sense. So yes, a theory can definitely guide us here and should, I think. I'm going to collect two final questions quickly, and then you have a quick final response. Sure. So uh, I think versions of this question have appeared in the last two questions, but I just I guess I want to push you on this particular point because it it seems like it applies to all all of the methods that that you mentioned as well, the multiverse and other other things, which is like model averaging, right, has existed for a long time. Yeah, the idea yeah. that that you would uh, have some different specifications and that yeah. you would adjust it based on, right, that you would have assigned different weights to different specifications based on some criteria of model fit, Absolutely. right? And, and I guess it's hard for me then knowing that to, to, to look at these approaches and see that they're essentially treating all specifications equally mm. uh, after the fact. That is to say they're not taking into account any information about uh, how well that specification actually fit the data. Um, and, uh, it, 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 and even that it's almost a biasing approach in that it draws your attention to the middle of the distribution yeah. of specifications, regardless of whether that happens to be where the good fitting models actually are. Mm. Um, and so I was wondering if you had thoughts about how, how whether a method should be incorporating um, uh, model fit, and, and if so, how? Yeah, well. Pair, just a second. Yeah, OK. Hi, this is more of a, um, a question about the, the slide where you show that analytical choices uh, influence the correlations. And uh, I saw that the variance uh, between the correlations are not very high, although different results. So I saw that there is a variance of 0.1 about. Um, so uh, I, I also found similar results in a different research, and I was told that those correlations, the difference and the variance of these correlations differences are not very important. Uh, what would you say to people that say, well, that's basically 
not irrelevant, but those differences are small and uh, not very meaningful. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So let me start with the last question and, first. And try to do it in about a minute if you can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will. Um, yeah. Okay. So last question. Uh, yes. I think this is also something that surprised me seeing this, how these SMS came out, that they are actually fairly consistent. And when we do find marked differences, it's because we vary something big, right? Whether we look at the mother or father. So I think this is reassuring, um, actually. Um, uh, now, I think one big caveat here is that I think if you were using like typical survey data, you know, with with a, with a smaller sample and and with with noisy uh, survey reported measures, you would find a lot more variability. Um, so so we should I think be cautious um, uh, about the extent to which this generalizes. Um, now, uh, Jeremy's question about how to incorporate model fit, um, I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. As I said, I mean, I don't, I, it's, the model fit is not really relevant in our case, uh, since we're looking at bivariate correlations, so I haven't really thought about it. Um, I know it's a big, big question in the literature. Um, I know there has been a lot of discussion about the Manus Young article, especially for, for, for this reason. Um, so uh, if I was interested in, in answering that question, you know, that's, that's the place where I would start digging, but I, I don't have, um, I don't have, uh, I don't have an answer. Do you? No. Oh. But I, yeah, but I, I think the general point holds that I, it's 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 a very bad approach to to just like average, um, uh, you know that that's not really informative. We do want to make distinctions about um, which specifications are better or not somehow. Yeah. The remaining discussions later into the coffee break. Thank you, Perry. Thank you.